Folks, welcome back to So Bad It's Good, presented by Betches Media. Now, um, I got presented with an interview guest uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I went and checked out the uh, the name, and immediately I knew who it was. Because if you are on social media, you have seen him. He has so many viral videos that takes you into the mind of an employee at a real retail job. Uh, I mean, just so much uh, uh, wisdom is coming out of this man. He provides a voice for the voiceless. And I am so excited because he has a new book out now called The Customer is Always Wrong, an unhinged guide to everything that sucks about work from an angry retail guy. He's also a comedian, an actor, a writer. You might have seen his work in a little film called Cocaine Bear, but he's written this fantastic book that is perfect for somebody, anybody with a job. Whether they've quit a job, whether they're working at a job, this is for everybody. So before we start, I need you to run on down to Amazon right now and you order this, or you go to your local bookstore, you buy it because you are going to want to have this. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, the one, the only, Scott C. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Ryan. That might have been the best intro of all time. I don't think I've gotten a better that's, intro than that before. Scott, I always tell people that's that's as good as you're going to get. That's the <laughs> intro, and then it goes way downhill at this point. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> it's all downhill from here. Can I, can I tell you, I'm a fan of your yeah. podcast. I listened to you recap some Love Island USA. Oh my God, the fact that you even, that's insane because I've been enjoying your videos for what feels like years. Um, and reading this book was truly a joy. Like you guys, I can't express that I was actually reading it with my own eyes, even though it's an audio book as well. And so I was patting myself on the back, but how many people have read this now that said, you've literally made them relive their worst experiences as an employee somewhere? I mean, I mean, quite a bit. I mean, the purpose of the book, obviously, is to give give you some catharsis. It's supposed to be like all of the stuff that you would you would want to say at your job, but just can't. The stuff you're hiding in your head, like just like my videos are, like you know, the stuff like you know, if someone comes up to you and they're like, "I've been a customer here for over forty years," and you think, "Oh, good, then you'll be dead soon," or you know, I've been, you know, the website said this was in stock. Well, what do your eyes say? The, the website also has pictures of employees smiling. Do you see that? Do you see that anywhere? Like that. So the book just expands on all that, and it's just a bunch of like bits and rants and comedy pieces about all the worst parts of having a job, finding a job. And the, the, whole, the whole purpose of the book was I was like, I wanted to recreate that feeling of when you're in the break room with your coworkers, just, you know, talking shit and letting off some steam. Like, that is what I wanted the book to feel like. Well, and then, I mean, you talk about some of your job experiences. I mean, you were a, a social media person at Ikea. I mean, that's one of the first videos I saw you do. Yeah. So I was, uh, I worked at the call center for Ikea. So I was, t- I took phone calls <laughs> and I answered people on Twitter and Facebook and everything like that. So I was, so a, a lot of like the, the first types of videos I made, like the ones that are just like, oh, you know, you just lost yourself a customer like that, those kind of things that all came from real life. You know, and in my mind, I'm like, well, I'm not an undercover boss. Like, what the hell are you talking about? I lost a customer. I'm not worried about the profit margin here. Okay. But the, uh, <laughs> so that stuff was all real. And then after Ikea, I was, uh, I did social media for PBS, like a regular office job. There's a yeah, which, by the, the way, book. you guys, so, sorry to interrupt you guys, but Yo. there's a point in the book where he's talking about PBS and somebody's like, fucking antiques roadshow. And I was like, <laughs> that's intense. <laughs> Yes, that ha- that happened. There was a producer, like I worked on a show at PBS and they got bumped <laughs> from their time slot by Antiques Roadshow. And the guy stood up and was like, oh, fuck Antiques Roadshow. And I'm like, what is going on at PBS? PBS is like succession. Like it's that like high stakes. <laughs> like people are angry working at PBS. And like you think like, didn't, didn't Elmo used to work here? Like why? Calm down, you know, but, uh, I mean, Mr. Rogers was on PBS for the Mr. love of Mr. Rogers God. was on PBS. Yes. And then when the camera stopped, he was like, uh, no one better fucking take my 8 a.m. or whatever time slot, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, no, I'm sure he was a positive um, man. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, you point out so many things that I think we can all just completely understand and relate to. Um, and, you know, your videos obviously do the same. What actually uh, inspired you to to put this down in the written form? Because at this point, Scott, I have to imagine if you ever have to go back to a real job, you're toast. There's no way. <laughs> oh, 
That's the issue. That's the issue. I think I call this out in the book too, but like I've made my whole brand about being completely unhirable. So this book has to be successful. My comedy career has to be successful because there's no, there's nowhere to go after this. I can't go back to Ikea and pick up more, you know, shifts for material. I'm, I'm banned. I think I'm banned from all of Sweden for what I've done. But, uh, I, you know, I, I think that, uh, I, you know what? I even forgot what the question was that we started with because now I'm thinking about my career. No, it prospects. was just, I mean, it was just that you're unhirable. I was reading this whole thing yes. and I just thought, man, thank God you're going to be probably successful in entertainment for the rest of your life because if not, because I was thinking about myself, I said, if this podcasting thing goes away, I'm done. I don't know how to use Excel. I don't know how to do a cover letter, <laughs> which you talk about in the book, all the resumes yep. you have to update. You, that's what I said. You gave me PTSD and a real fear for my future. Future. Yeah, wait till I uh, wait till I come out with my second book. Podcasting is always wrong. Podcasters <laughs> are always wrong. It's two hundred pages of, of current uh, uh, SD. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I mean, but what was the inspiration to take all of the videos that you were making yes. and the online content into uh, book form? Yeah, so I, you know, I do stand up too, and uh, I was, you know, on the road a lot, and people come out to my shows and just tell me like the worst things that have ever happened to them at work, and it's a super fun thing, and uh, you know, I get a like my, I like to think of my shows as also kind of cathartic experiences for for you know customer service workers and stuff, and I would have people come up to me all the time and go, dude, I could write a book with how much I've seen, I could write a book about my <laughs> career or whatever. And then I started to think I could write a book. Like, you know, I st they started <laughs> to implant the idea. And then all of a sudden I wrote like a pitch for it and uh, had the idea of like expanding on the videos, doing stuff I'd never done in the videos and writing jokes beyond just like a 15 second TikTok. And uh, luckily it got picked up by a publisher and, and now it's out. So it's it's been a really... Yeah. Um, long it took me about like a year and a half almost two years to get the full thing out but yeah man i'm excited i mean i know this is uh yeah i mean that, that's the other thing and i i know this is uh kind of amazing is there a point where you're like holy crap i released an actual book like no matter what happens to me there is a book out there that will always be there Dude, I walked into on the day it came out, I walked into Barnes and Noble with my wife and we saw it on the shelf. And I in my brain I was like, Well, that's a mistake. They shouldn't have that. Like, how does that <laughs> how's that really sitting right there? Yeah, it's 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 a very surreal uh thing, but I'm I'm super proud of how it turned out. And you know, I, I wanted to make it as funny as possible, like as funny as my videos. I would dude, I, I was cra I was crazy when I was writing this book. I would have my wife read drafts. And I would time how long between she was laughing, like between laughs. I would time <laughs> that out, write down how many times she laughed at a page and everything. Like I was trying to be mathematical about this whole thing. <laughs> well, I mean, like, and also I just want to, uh, to the audience, the illustrations in this are amazing. It adds a whole nother level to this book. Uh, I mean, even it just starts off with a, you know, at work, thumbs up, being, you know, be, no, no, being at work, thumbs down, not <laughs> yes, being at work, exactly. thumbs up. Uh, I mean, the illustrations are amazing. Who did those? Yeah. So it's a really talented uh, illustrator named Johnny Sampson uh, based in Chicago. I found him. He did a little work on the uh, some of the digital uh, covers and, and art for the Comedy Bang Bang book. And just I loved his style. And uh, he he just captured me perfectly, like in all of the I images, I think. And he added like his own jokes throughout the illustration. So they kind of add to the comedy of the book. And, uh, you know, I basically went to him and I was like, dude, do you want to draw someone who looks like if Ted Lasso got concerning health news? And he was like, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, what is your what's been your worst experience uh, in retail or any job, uh, that you've had thus far? It was probably, you know, I mean, this isn't a retail story, but what I, I, so I used to do, I'm going to say another insane job, improvised murder mystery dinner theater. That was a job for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I was an improvised murder mystery dinner theater actor. So you had to do customer service while pretending you lived in, you know, 1934 and were a member <laughs> of the mob or something. And basically, like, people would get really into it, and they would get mad if you misled them. So I was, like, a working actor, and uh, I had 
I all I was living on was McDonald's breakfast and I had ordered like five hash browns to eat for the day. Like that was what I was going to eat before the show. And I had a receipt, a McDonald's receipt for five hash browns. And I, during the show, I threw it in the trash and audience members, because I was playing the detective, they went into the trash and dug through the garbage to find my receipt. They thought it was a clue. They thought I was leading them. <laughs> And they came back and they were like, how do you explain this? And I was like, my life is sad. What do you mean? I don't have money yeah. for food. And like, and they were like, they were like, this isn't a part of the show. And they got mad at me for making them dig through the garbage. And I was like, you did that yourself. You did that. I didn't make you do that. So that was, that was a whole, you know, customer service uh, debacle where it's like, you made us dig through the trash for clues. Like, dude, people took it so seriously. I mean, that, that's the thing. I mean, like, uh, I know people you said come up to you at your shows and want to share their experiences, but that was it. Yes. I mean, like, the book is kind of so filled with so much joy because it's all this, like, can you believe we all work 40 plus hours a week if we're lucky and this is what we spend <laughs> our lives doing? And everybody, I mean, yes. you made me think, I thought about my shitty, uh, my shitty uh, movie theater job, my Blockbuster job where they, I had to give a hair sample at Blockbuster Video back in the day for a drug test. And I was like 16 years, I was like, what are we what? doing at Blockbuster that you took a hair sample? But it, you made me think about all of these things that I've gone through in the workforce. And I was like, God, what? everybody has these stories. So they're going to love this book it's blockbuster we're all high I know. everyone is high <laughs> oh. everyone is on drugs here like you have to be uh, like that is wild they, they, I, I mean does blockbuster have like a laboratory in the back how are they testing your hair i was like you're sending this away I mean, by the way, it's probably just some like creepy manager that just wanted my hair. But I remember yeah, just thinking, right. this is way this too is for my intense. personal files. Thank you. <laughs> and a big, big sniff. Yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> that is so funny. Yeah, man. Well, I appreciate you saying that you got some positivity out of the book because I think that's a lot of I think a lot of my my content that I make in the book, it can kind of get um, mistaken for like complaining or being negative. But it's it, it's really like complaining in, in defense of people who are you know trying yes. their hardest and are getting underpaid and overworked so i really do feel like there's this positive like uplifting uh um uh kind of comedy coming from like the rants that i do and and, and what i've written in the book so i appreciate you saying you that. know i I always view you when I see your videos as a man of the people, you, you know, like I Thank said, you. like, you know, for all of us employees out there, you speak for us and we are always told to go above and beyond in all of our jobs. But sometimes the customer forgets what it's like to actually be an employee or they're so miserable sometimes in their own lives that they need to take it out on you. And I always felt bad for anybody that had to deal with my mom, like that worked at an airline <laughs> because I mean, she was like, She'd be on there for hours trying to get what she needed done. And I always wanted to get their numbers and apologize after the fact. I mean, you worked at a call center. I mean, you had insane calls all the time. Well, this is the issue. This is the issue. It's, the, it's like people don't realize you're calling a call center. If you're not getting what you want, the person on the other end of the phone, they are not sitting next to a button that says fix this issue and they're just like pr playing coy with pressing it you know what i'm saying there's not <laughs> there's not a switch that they're that like all they have to do is crank it and your product is going to get fixed like there's a whole system that they can't control like you know at, at ikea it's like th there was a delivery company that we couldn't you know get get in touch with or had lost merchandise or whatever it was and then there's you know a billion approvals and and that you have to get so it's like if someone it, like that's what I want to that's what I want to say to some people on the phone that get frustrated. It's like it's like, don't you think if I could get you off this phone right now and fix your issue, I would do it. I don't want to talk to you either. I don't want to talk to you anymore. If I could fix your issue, I swear to God, I would just fix it right now. But it, but I cannot. So it's like that. That's what it is. Like I, I am just being the customer service person. I'm just being paid to get yelled at by you. That's what my job is right now. Yes, you know, I'm yes. just the wall I mean, you're, protecting yeah, the, the, you're the, like the, a the weird bosses. Therapist. 
you're like a therapist yes. for these people as well. Um, I was thinking about the book and obviously how you started and just to walk people through your origin story or your evolution. Obviously, you were an actor big in the uh, murder mystery dinner theater game. Uh, <laughs> I was huge in that what, circuit, man. Yeah. <laughs> I was huge. <laughs> What is the first time you decided, hey, I'm going to put myself on camera and I'm going to do a rant? Like, how did that all work? And when did you realize that people were, um, you know, really kind of taken by it? Yeah. Well, yeah. So it was so I've been doing stand up comedy for for years, like the open mic scene. I was hosting at clubs. And then it was really when, you know, the lockdown happened during the pandemic and I couldn't go out and do stand up. I pivoted to TikTok and was trying a bunch of things. And then I just made this i had all these customer service jokes i'd never done on stage so i made this video as an angry customer service rep with this like you know great music which is from bad girls club oh that music show with his great oh i was gonna ask you about that that's from bad girls club yes yes that's from bad girls club <laughs> oh my it's the perfect guys you've seen his videos it's the perfect it always comes in like about five seconds into the video and it yes. just ramps up the intensity boom boom yeah so so the uh so i made this customer service video and the next day it had you know over a million views just from like 12 hours and i had never had anything that took off like that and so i just kept making you know more and now i you know i've been making them for like three years about all sorts of different things now not even just work related about like you know housing prices and like all, all kinds of stuff rent all, all kinds and um they just kept getting viewed and then eventually they were doing so well on tiktok someone who wasn't me took them and put them on twitter in like a big compilation and that's when people like, you know, Pat Oswalt and Elizabeth Banks and LeBron James started sharing it. And then dude, it just went off from there. And I've just been headlining and acting, you know, across the country. It's just been a, such a yeah, well, great ride. I mean, which, by the way, uh, Pat Oswalt says this about you. Scott Cease is a hilarious geyser of rage, cynicism and venom, all delivered with a Dundalk accent that could peel paint. I love him. That's from Pat and Flippin Oswalt. <laughs> My I God. know it's crazy. It's crazy. He loves my home. so Dundalk, I, Maryland. That's where I'm from. He loves Dundalk, Maryland, and and the, and the people of Dundalk, Maryland, as do I, of course. Uh, you know, great working class town. But um, uh, yeah, man, he was like one of the. He even at one point, like when I was first going off, like had a. Uh, it was some tweet about someone um criticizing like the workers at Disney World or Disneyland or something. And Patton like replied to the tweet and was like, Scott, make a video and take this dude down. Like Patton was sending me out on missions, like side missions on, <laughs> on social media for a while there, which was so funny. <laughs> Um, some of the things that you cover in the book, I just wanted to get your quick take on, um, uh, companies that say oh, yeah. we want real people interested in real opportunities. Oh, did you, did I cut out? Right. And that of course translates to, we oh. will take literally anyone. Oh, Ryan, are you there? Oh, sorry. I think I just cut out for a sec. Let me just mark that. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. I can hear you. Scott, now. did I lose you? Okay. Sorry. Sorry. You just oh, no, 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 I'm here. Um, uh, you good. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. What about PTO? What's your view on PTO? Oh man, don't deny the request. Your PTO is request your PTO request is denied. Then I guess I'm calling in sick. You just activated my <laughs> trap card. You didn't think I had a backup plan? You understand me? Like PTO is the is the craziest thing to me. The, the fact that it's like th this isn't a request. I'm just telling you what's going to happen. I'm not going to be here. You figure this out. Like that honestly, honestly. PTO is not a request. It's I, it's basically like a grenade that you toss into your boss's lap. That's what PTO should be, really. <laughs> And I, I love that they make you feel guilty about taking the time that you earned off. They love to make you feel guilty. Oh my gosh, it's 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 insane. It's like, and then like the wor the worst part is is when they go like, okay, well you can take off, but just make sure to get like all the work done that you were going to do that day by the end of today. And it's like, no, 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 I'm not doing two days worth of work. I'm being I'm taking a day <laughs> off of work. Like the math the math is not working out here, man. Okay, I'm off work. That's what I'm doing. Uh, you talk also in the book about company culture 
And I always think, I always hear about these like fantastical places like Google back, you know, or Netflix where they provide you with meals and food. I've never had that experience of a company culture. How do you view company culture? I mean, I think it's all just kind of like <laughs> bullshit, to be honest with you. I don't know. <laughs> I just think it's bullshit. It's like this kind of, uh, you know, they, they, they want it to seem like you are a family here. So you feel guilty about leaving. You feel guilty about taking time off. And they, they want to have this kind of perception that like, uh, you know, we're all on the same side. And even if you're getting under, you know, underpaid, overworked, and then all of a sudden, well, you, you know, you're just lucky to be a part of this culture. We have such a great culture. You're lucky to have this job. And it's like, no, you're, you're lucky I show up. You're lucky I'm here. You're lucky I don't throw a trash can through the window and escape at any opportunity. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, one of my favorite lines that I wrote in the in the book is the one that says, um, uh, when you're at like a training seminar and they're like, now presenting our company's 39 core values is one of them mercy. <laughs> like, I can't, I can't sit through this anymore, man. <laughs> oh, this is the first time I heard this in the book. What is clopin? Oh, clopin? That's when you are working a closing shift at a store immediately followed by working an opening shift. So you get about, you know, six hours to sleep and eat before you're right back at work. And it's like, I mean, I mean, my, my wife, uh, Amanda, she used to work at the Disney store. She would work those types of shifts sometimes. And it's just like, what are we doing here, folks? Like, let's yeah. just figure out, like, like treat this like a logic puzzle. No one should be coming in. Like, people are like, oh, we legally have to make sure you have eight hours between your shifts. So we're giving you eight hours in one minute. And it's like, I don't think that's what the, the law was intended there. I don't think that's what they were <laughs> intending for you to do. I think it was supposed to be more than that or whatever. I mean, you guys listening, I mean, he points out every little thing, even like that thing of taking your lunch at the end of the day so you could actually leave 30 minutes early. That's illegal. <laughs> You can't do that. Like, they, no, 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 no. You've got to take it at a certain time where you cannot do anything with your life. You cannot game the system. That's what, yeah, that, that's what I tried to do at Ikea because I can't, I mean, I can't stand the like, oh, this is a eight, eight and a half hour shift. You clock out for lunch. You clock out 30 minutes for lunch. And it's like, bro, that's got to be a part of the eight hours. How did we let that slip past us? <laughs> no. How did we let companies take add 30 minutes onto an eight hour shift instead of the lunch being a part of it. I, that was a huge loss. That was a huge loss for us. No, I mean, like, I mean, thank God for this, this, this show that I do now, but I remember spending an hour in Los Angeles traffic to go to a work at an acting studio. And then it was all actors coming in. And if I had a commercial audition, I would have to take off work, drive an hour to Santa Monica, have to make up that time on the back end. And I was like, Los Angeles, I love it dearly, but sometimes that's the worst because everybody there is an actor working retail jobs that's completely upset that they're not a working actor yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, God. pretty much. Yeah. Um, uh, you talk about the different types of uh, employees that you work with, which can be the saving grace of these jobs. And uh, oh, yeah. I mean, you have like 30 of it. You have the hustler, the one who's living for the drama, the miss. Like, what are these different types of employees that you work with? Yeah, these these different types of coworkers that that we see at every job, like the person that always like comes in late, but they've got a Dunkin' Donuts iced coffee with them, and it's like, what what happened? What, what what's going on? Or, or, or like you know the people that are, are you can tell that they're just in it for the LinkedIn endorsement later on. It's like they're gonna ask me to endorse their emailing their email <laughs> etiquette on LinkedIn later on tonight. Um, you know, it's just types of coworkers that we see at every job, and or that I especially that I worked with at IKEA. And then, you know, I like to go into more absurdist things in, in the book, too. Like I talk about the uh, the Kevin Hart type of worker where it's like even on their breaks, they're filming like a Capital One commercial or something. It's like, dude, <laughs> stop working for a second, man. <laughs> no, I mean, like you nailed every one of these people and you bring up LinkedIn. And like I, I, I got an email last week that I was like seen in like 20 searches on LinkedIn. And I was like, oh, yeah. how and for how and for what? I don't even use LinkedIn. And it seems to be one of like the biggest social media. Like, I, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I'd be horrible in the workforce. I don't even know. But LinkedIn is huge these days. That's a part of the whole game. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. You've got to be on LinkedIn. When I was like tr hunting down an office job, I was constantly like, just like not cold calling, but, you know, just sending out messages to HR reps and being like, love your profile, love your posts, 
uh, would love to get on the phone and talk about open positions. And it's like, can you just hear how much bullshit I'm spewing at you from the computer, <laughs> just from the text on screen? Like everything that's written on LinkedIn, it's like, okay, this is the most performative. You want to talk about being performative on social media. People make fun of like Instagram influencers taking a picture of their food or whatever. It's like, no, it's really the most performative people online are the people that post on LinkedIn like, I'm so proud to be a part of the Arby's team or something like that. You know, it's like that. <laughs> I'm not That's even proud to eat at Arby's and I eat at Arby's. Like, are you kidding me? Um, have you, have you actually come into contact or like have people from like Ikea or past jobs reached out to you since you've blown up and be like, what's up, man? Oh, you're <laughs> killing it. I, I, we totally inspired you. Oh, totally. I mean, I literally, uh, the first stand up show post like going viral that I did in, in Maryland, I had all my former IKEA coworkers there, which was super fun. Uh, and they were the first people that told me that like IKEA, I, cause I, I had this like right up in the Baltimore sun, like when I first went, uh, viral and, uh, they reached out to IKEA and IKEA made a statement about me in, in this newspaper, <laughs> which was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Which was incredible. That was like the proudest moment of my what? life. But they were like, Scott sees does not represent us or <laughs> the feelings of our employees. And then the first comment underneath the article was, yes, he does. You know, so I was pretty happy with that. I was pretty happy he with does that. Not he does they not were trying to distance themselves. The they were like, family. we don't know this guy. This guy you know, they, they, they said I didn't work for them, but you know, I didn't work for them at the time, but you know, I had in the past, but it, it was just so funny. Yeah. I mean, you even have a classification system also for, uh, you know, the, the different types of customers that you deal with, you know, there's different levels of customers that everybody deals with. I mean, you really broke down every piece <laughs> of the working experience. Uh, but fill a book, it, man. I'm sitting over here trying yeah, to fill yeah. a whole book with this. <laughs> we got to get granular well, here. How do, we got to describe the, the difference that, between enti entitled whiny baby and full on psycho. Like we have to get into that uh, kind of difference no, there. No. It's important. Those things are important. Well, uh, that's the, you, you said all of this started taking off during the pandemic, but like to me, that was such a weird time for work because everything, you know, everyone took to zoom and everybody was online. And I was trying to think in your head, like during that time, I mean, it kind of changed that whole customer experience completely. Like, what was your yeah. take? I mean, not what was your take on the pandemic, but like, how do you think that changed the workforce? And then coming back, how did it change us? Great question. Great question. Um, I think I honestly think that there, there was a, a more of an awareness that our jobs and the companies we work for don't care about us as much as we think they they do you know you know what i mean or they don't as much whatever we thought in the past like the, you know the the job will take care of us the company will take care of us like just be a company person and work your way up the ladder and do it and and the, the covid kind of exposed like nah man some of these companies they will throw you to the fucking wolves like you know you know what i mean like these retail workers being asked to just like come into the store no matter what and like fight with people like trying to get in if they're not wearing a mask or whatever like whatever their issue is like it's like the, the, these people were kind of asked to go back to work so quickly if you worked like an in-person entry level job and uh and, and and it was in a at a time where it's like yeah they say that things are you know safety's being considered but like is it it seems like the priority really is profit over the well-being of employees and i think a lot of people just kind of even if they had had that thought in the past that came to the forefront of everyone's mind and so you know, I like to think that's like when they saw my videos of, you know, me playing a, a, an employee losing his mind, absolutely like losing his shit on, on the people that uh, he's supposed to be like completely uh, uh, serving. Then it's like that connected with people because it's like, oh, my God, we're all at this breaking point with work where we, where we don't want work to be the center of our lives. We want to be able to do other things like work shouldn't be as big as a, a priority as it is. And that's kind of, you know, what I go into the book. I mean, that's the serious message of the book. It's a comedy book, but no, I like to put in those yeah, little by, tidbits by the way, you of, guys, that, so, of that so, kind yeah, of real yeah, stuff. Yeah. 
No, I mean, I, I've said this so many times, but like, guys, there is like 10 laughs a page. You are going to put it down. You're going to laugh. You're going to think about your horrible experiences. Then you're going to pick the back, the book back up. You're going to have that rinse repeat for like over 220 <laughs> pages. I'm telling you. And by the way, Scott, I got to say, I, my, my nephew just entered the workforce at 16 oh, years really? old and I, I bought him a copy of this book, which should be uh, headed to him in Arizona on Saturday because he got his first job at Best Buy over the uh, the holiday season, this past holiday. And I was like, yeah, because he, you know, he wants to earn his own money. And I was, you know, he came home from his first shift and he was like, dude. And I was like, dude, dude. But like, he's going to, dude. Lo- this is a cautionary tale, this book. Oh my gosh, man. Thank you so much. I love that story. Thank you for, for giving it as a gift. I, I, I hope he enjoys it, man. And, and you know what? I will keep him in my thoughts, thoughts and prayers to him if he, <laughs> while he's prayers. working That's at Best Buy. Really- <laughs> Um, uh, as we start winding down here, you obviously, uh, doing stand up. uh, you've been doing that for a long time. Um, just since this is a pop culture show as well, what do you yeah. and your wife like to watch? What do you guys like to listen to? Things like that. Oh my gosh. Well, I, I mean, I said at the beginning of the show, we were obsessed with Love Island USA this year. We were, we, and then Dude, we went down the Love oh yeah, Island S- rabbit Scott, hole. Scott, I talked to Ian, I talked to Ian Sterling, the narrator today. What? Like, Are you to- kidding me? Tonight. Tonight. <laughs> yes, it was crazy. Oh, my God. I am jealous. I am jealous as hell. <laughs> oh, my God. You know what? Like, literally, you know, when you start to, like, learn a different language and, like, you start to dream in, in that language or something? I, I think I've started to dream in his voice. I've heard his voice now so long. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> That is hilarious. But yeah, I mean, I love like reality competition. Uh, I, any show where people get eliminated, I'm in. The, you know, the traitors, the challenge, survivor, whatever. I, I love those types of shows, man. Um, and then as far as like podcasts and stuff, I love uh, I, yours, obviously. My no, God. No, no, and no, no. Then- I mean, like, or even just music. What kind of music do you guys like? What kind of like? I love oh. to hear what other people are listening to, watching, that kind of thing. Here's something not a lot of people know. I'm a musical guy. I love show tunes. I, I did musical theater, you know, in, in school and everything like that. I lo- I'll throw on a nice Hello Dolly soundtrack and I'll be fine. I'll be walking down the street. <laughs> Which, by the way, he, he drops a Rent lyric in this book, you guys. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm a huge fan of the musical Rent. <laughs> Uh, how do you measure, measure a lot? Like, that was, I was like, hell yeah, Rent, baby. Nice, nice. Yeah, man, and, uh, and then, and then, then obviously, guess- and then horror movies too. We we just saw, we saw um Long Legs. Oh my God, have you seen it? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, Nicolas is- Cage. That opening scene is insane. I think it's one of the best Nicolas Cage performances ever. I thought it totally worked. I was scared. I was unsettled and uncomfortable the whole time. So great, great horror movie. Uh, I'm sure you've been asked this, uh, 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 you know, a hundred times, but. Like, are you going to turn this book into a TV show? I mean, like, I know that sounds crazy, but like workplace comedies, you have The Office, you have all of these things. Why can't your life, why can't this be its own TV show? Because I was just reading this. I'm like, God, you got six seasons right here. (laughs) You know what? From your mouth to a Hollywood producer's ears. Okay. Why can't it? Why can't it? That's what I'll say. Why can't it? it? it it might already be in the works. I mean, who knows? But um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I do. I know I'm just overly excited, but I'm just so excited that I actually read a book with my eyes and that I <laughs> flipping loved it. And, and it's one of those easy books to recommend because like you said, everybody has a story and this is just yeah. the tip of the iceberg in what we talked about because, you know, it's that perfect book to pick up, laugh, put down, pick it up again, laugh. I'm telling you, you will not regret this. Buy this as a gift for uh, the employed in your life. And then um, uh, in terms of the people out there in the workforce, and you talked about competition reality series, I was like, the workforce feels like a competition reality (laughs) series with so many people getting fired these days. What is your advice to all of us out there in the working world? Um, Realize that you have more power than the company makes you feel like you do that that's the that's the issue like like you know you can uh if you want to change your schedule or whatever you want to take time off like realize that they need you more than you need them 
Uh, and I would try to say, you know, don't feel bad because companies will do whatever they can to underpay and overwork. So you as your as a worker, you got to find, you know, the shortcuts and the, the strategies to kind of get the most at maximize your time while at work. So, you know, you're powerful. You're powerful. That, I, I sound like Tony Robbins or something like that. You, you, you're right. powerful. Yeah, you got to understand, you guys, you have the power. Well, which, I, was trying to, I, I mean, by the way, the people listening right now, I hope you guys are listening on one of an AirPod at a desk, and I hope you're sneaking listening to this. I mean, that is the best promotion of this book, to be listening to this while you're working. Uh, yes. I always tell people once Wednesday hits, just phone it in the rest of the week. So hopefully you guys are doing that right now. Yes, I always say it's the perfect gift for anyone who's ever had a bad day at work. Perfect read or the perfect gift for anyone who's had a bad day uh, at work. And it's like, that's everybody. Come on. That's, that's everybody, everybody knows that. It's, I mean, yeah. Um, Scott, thank you so much for being here. The The book, once again, you guys, is The Customer is Always Wrong, an unhinged guide to everything that sucks about work from an angry retail guy. I'm going to put the link in the show notes. I'm also going to put all his socials. You probably already follow him because he's got millions of followers. But man, thank you for making my week better. You really brought a smile to my face this week. And uh, thanks for being here. I, I'm sure you've had a crazy week launching this book. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for having me on. Dude, I love your energy. You're a great host. I, I, I love all the questions about the book. You asked some great questions, man. So I really appreciate it, dude. Well, hopefully next season of Love Island comes on, we can get you and your wife on and we can just rant about Love Island. I would absolutely love to come on and, and, and make jokes about whatever the hell is going to happen next <laughs> season. I would love that.